Hello and welcome to a Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Tuller. I am a JP a John Pollard from the Two Man Power Trip of Wrestling, and of course, joining me as always is the former WCW and ECW World Tag Team Champion, former NWA Florida World Heavyweight Champion, of course, one of the greatest minds and bookers in professional wrestling history, Mister Kevin Sullivan, the Taskmaster, the Games Master, the Devil himself. How you doing today, Kevin? Doing great, John. How are you? Doing very good. I, I can't complain. All this uh, political stuff is getting to me a little bit because it's almost covering too much of the news. I'd like to focus on other things. I feel like it's too much politics out there. People are just nuts for it. Yeah, I mean, like you said, too much of the news. We don't know really what's going on in Afghanistan. You know, Europe is, uh, especially Germany, is, looks like, you know, they got militia groups and a bunch of things, other things in the world are going on. But Hey, uh, we're watching this, and uh, everybody has an opinion, and we're divided, and hopefully they'll get a little reprieve from being divided with this show. Absolutely. Now, this is an interesting topic today because it's going to be all about the number one requested topic, which is so weird. There's been other topics that was definitely requested a lot, but I don't no idea why. But this one was requested a lot by a lot of people. That is the Dungeon of Doom. Are you shocked by people actually requesting to want to hear about the Dungeon of Doom? Uh, I'll tell you, John, it, it's grown uh, in the last few years. Like I would I mean, it was to me a very it hurt my career but i did it for the i believe the best reason to convince hulk he could trust me and turn him heel and that's why i took all his friends and put him in one lumped him in one group but it's taken a life on its, on its own and uh i guess people are seeing for what it was comic relief it tongue-in-cheek and uh you know, I for some reason it's become like to me it's the uh, Plan Nine from Outer Space done by Ed Woods. You know that. <laughs> yes. That's what yep. it is. And, and now Plan Nine from Outer Space is one of the cult classics of all times. So if you think about this, basically 95 to 97 is the run of the Dungeon of Doom and WCW. This big heel faction, of course, you had the Four Horsemen going at, along at that time, too. More of the serious guys. These, the Dungeon of Doom were more almost cast out of the 80s. But the kind of fruition or kind of how it started was the three faces of fear. It was you, Beefcake, and John Tenta, who was the avalanche. So when, when you guys put that group together, that's specifically when, when it's starting. It's like Hogan loves uh, avalanche. Hogan knows you forever. Hogan loves Beefcake. Is that like what's going on here? He wants to work with those three guys? Yeah, and if you look back, I had a lot of heels hurt. And uh, Rick was hurt or in contract negotiations. Or... Uh, enough heels, and I had to keep the spotlight on Hogan, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, he was comfortable with Brutus and John, and John was a wonderful human being. Brutus is a big guy, but John was a wonderful human being, and he had, he was, Hulk was really comfortable with those two guys, so I said, okay, uh, you know, we gotta put our finger in the dike right now, and, uh, you know, he had drawn money, with John and Brutus being his dear friend, it it put him at ease too. I didn't have to put him in there with somebody he hadn't worked with, that he might not have been comfortable with, and uh, that's where we went. So the interesting thing that happens here is you hear a voice in the arena, Sullivan, Sullivan, come to me, Sullivan. And this I guy, he, yes, my son, my son, Sullivan, my son keeps calling you. We eventually find out this mysterious voice is the master, the leader of the Dungeon Doom, the, I guess, uh, the prince, King Curtis, right? I mean, is this just, you You had a relationship with him, wanted to bring him in, thought he'd be good for the role. What, like, what's his, how did he get into WWE at this point? John, guys from my era, whether it be Dusty, whether it was Billy Graham, 
whether it was Ric Flair, the greatest talk of all times was King Curtis. And he was beloved in the wrestling business. And as Curtis said, I want one more trip on the Milky Way. And uh, I actually brought the idea to Hogan, and Hogan loved it because Hogan and, and uh, King were very, very close. King was a tremendous athlete. And Curtis was uh, went to school at UCLA, Berkeley, and was an orator. So that's where, I mean, there's a fa fabulous story. When Hawaii was a territory in uh, the early 60s, they had a minute left to go. And this is in the early days of being able to follow ratings. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a minute left to go. The show was short. And Ed Francis sent Curtis out there, and Curtis got him backwards from 60 to 1, and the ratings went up. Wow. He was such a commanding presence. And, I mean, the other thing uh, I suggest that our friends look at is King was a fabulous worker, whether he was a babyface or heel. He was dead-ass <laughs> serious. But, you know, he had gone... Uh, to New York before, I didn't he manage Kamala? Yep. You know, I think and, at one point briefly. I know he was in uh, WBF for a, a cup of coffee, so they say. Yeah. Yep. And, and Hulk brought him in then, and you know the great white Bengal tiger and all that stuff. Curtis mm -hmm. really got Hulk over, and I think Hulk wanted to repay him a favor, and uh, rightfully so. <laughs> At first, I was like, who is this guy, this master? And then I realized, like, oh, my God. I was like, okay, you know, now we know who this is, you know, and he's going to bring you on, going to christen you the taskmaster. Is that a gimmick and a name that you're going to come up with that you oh, created? That was Hogan's. That was Hogan's. So how involved is he with creating Dungeon of Doom? Well, he actually came up to me and said, what can you do for my people? So... I understood my job, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, the other thing was, we, during this time, we had started to make the real turn to seriousness. And I still wanted to keep some of the WWF fans who had been used to the cartoon type characters. Yep. The main thing was, I wanted him to feel comfortable with me. I mean, just think about this at the time. Could I have put him with Brian Tillman? He would. He would have been um, on the fence about it. Yeah. No, I wouldn't been on the fence. It was been a definite no. Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. True. Yeah. And because, and this is no disrespect, his work was completely different than Hulk's. And at this period, you got to remember, John, uh, when Hulk first came over, he got off that movie. Uh, not movie, the TV show, Thunder in Paradise. Yep. If, did you ever take a real good look at him when he first came in, how thin he was? Very skinny. He literally looked like he may have lost like 50 pounds of muscle compared to his WBF days where he was, what, 303 or whatever he was. I mean, he was gigantic in WBF. Right. And the other thing was, where I caught it was when he started to do interviews, he was hunching over. I thought, and this is just me, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but I thought he lost confidence. Hmm. Well, he walked over from the other side. And like you said, he lost 50 pounds of muscle. And uh, I was really cautious about this. I'd never brought up Brian Pillman. The reason why I mentioned Brian Pillman, I mean, uh, I had a great angle with Brian, Brian, Brian. Not only did when Brian passed did we lose a great wrestler, we lost one of the greatest would have been minds of all times. And when we talked about feuds, John, we would have started and ended with Austin and Tillman, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. We're talking about the gun angle, right? Yep. How intense Brian was. And I think if I brought that up, Hogan again. I'm just surmising this. He would have said, "What's he? What's he trying to do to me?" 
you know, how would Hulk at that time work with Brian Pillman? Later on, when Brian got over, he wanted to work with Brian. Right, of course. But, of course, everybody did, right? But uh, there wasn't a lot of guys I could throw at him at that time. So I came up, and again, I, like I said, Rick was hurt. I, I, I'm not sure if Barry had gotten hurt, but I was short heels. So I said, hey, my long-range goal is to turn this guy heel, which he was dead set against, and make him feel comfortable that I'm doing the right thing for him. So that's that's how the three faces of fear came. So it's almost like you got to get him comfortable. Wrestles Flair first. I mean, they had some great matches, him and Flair. I mean, yeah. really, better than their WWF matches because their WWF matches are you know good but not great. The WCW matches were actually a lot better. Can I tell you why I think that, too? Mm -hmm. uh, I think you on the head. Rick was more over in WCW than he really was in WWF. Would you concur? Yes. Yeah, and so, hey, when you're over in a place like Rick was and Hogan was, the matches are going to go tremendous, usually. And they, you feel a lot more comfortable when you know you're over Rick. And, and during this time, as you remember, Rick was making some of the greatest interviews of, in history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we're basically a Southern company. And it was a little bit of a civil war, the North against the South. And I think, you know, if you listen to the tapes back then, and I'm... Um, the production company uh, did a hell of a job of browning out some of the booze from Hogan because he's in Rick's, you know, home ta home place. Yep. So I think, and the other thing was, during this period, there were the big two of the biggest stars in the history of the wrestling business, and I think Rick said. I'm going to show there's no animosity. I'm going to go out and bust my ass and make Hulk look the best he's ever been in WCW. And I think he did that. No doubt. They had some great matches, especially when he first came in in 94. They had some really good matches. What is your relationship with Hulk here? Because, you know, on, on screen, obviously, you're the guy pushing the end of Hulkamania. You got to kill Hulkmania. What's your relationship like with him off camera, off, off screen? You guys have a good relationship? Yeah, I knew him from the very beginning, you know, when he was in Tampa, starting to be a wrestler. And I had gone for a couple of shots when he was in Continental in Pensacola. And, uh, yeah, yeah, he was, uh, we had a great relationship. Were you ever surprised at all that he became, you know, the Babe Ruth of wrestling? Did you foresee that? Were you surprised at all? They're like, wow, this I can't believe, you know, this young punk I knew from Tampa is the biggest star in the business. Well, if, if I said I, I thought it would happen, uh, I'd be lying. But he was, you know, once that Rocky movie hit, it changed yep. the dynamic. And before that, because I believe at that time, wasn't he in AWA? Yep. He wrestled in, uh, I think it was in Dolphin, Alabama, as Sterling Golden, I think. I'm not, I may be wrong, but he came off that Atlanta TV at one time as Sterling Golden. And uh, he went to Pensacola area, and he drew a huge house, and I believe it was with Holly Race, and I mean, when I say a huge house, this is Dalton, Alabama. I think they had 20,000 people in outside stadium in Dalton, Alabama. Wow. Yeah. And it's so. funny, too, because if you go back to AWA, you watch those shows when he beat, beats Bockwinkle for the title and they reverse it. The crowd is, yeah. like, deflated. I mean, they're not happy. Like, they were literally go nuts that he won and then, like, deflated. So Vern almost a little bit too much of a stop and start with Hulk. He had something there, and he didn't realize it. Well, I think it is that a lot of people don't know the history. You know, he had made a deal with Vern that he could work in New Japan. And Vern wanted, I think, 50% of his merchandise and a booking oh. fee from New Japan. 
So I think it was one of those things where you give the guy the carrot and then take it back. And I thought, you know, I, I've thought about this a lot, John. And this is why I go back to Eddie Graham being such a smart guy. When the regional territories really start popping up was after the Chicago national TV, right? Yep. I mean, they always had uh, national, they always had regional territories, but back in those days, guys coming off the Chicago tape, when they were booked, like we'll say in Boston or New York, Dick the Bruiser, he would say in a little circle, TV star. Hmm. So you right. know, it was like when 17 started and Tommy Rich would go to, you know, other territories, they were coming to see Tommy. And uh, what happened was all those guys that took over the regional territories were wrestlers. Bob Geigel in Kansas City and Pat O'Connor. Vern. Uh, Dick the Bruiser. The Sheik, one of my dearest friends. Uh, the Fields in... The Fields Brothers in uh, Continental. Before it was Continental, it was Gulf Coast. Uh, Bill Watts when he went to Louisiana. All of them were wrestlers. The only one that followed Eddie's pattern is Eddie was through wrestling uh, full time and made, you know, other wrestlers. Eddie didn't put himself on top unless he was a special referee or he was in a six man with Mike or something. The rest of those guys couldn't let go and couldn't get the younger guys over and they didn't want to and it's it's if you look back what i'm saying to you here you have uh wilbur snyder and dick the bruiser they're the world heavyweight tag team champions bruises the world champion in his part of the world burns the world champion in his part of the world the Sheik is the U.S. champion in his part of the world, and none of them put guys over. And they were, I mean, Vern looked old when he was 30. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's yeah. when I think really hurt Minneapolis, and I'm sure uh, some people disagree with me, but as great a performer as Dick Bockwinkel was, and you hit it on the head when you said the fans were very disheartened with those finishes. They killed their own, you know, uh, Nick was, a, like I said, a fabulous worker, but he was in his early 50s. It was time to give it to Hulk and time to let the young guys get over. And I think, you know, we saw that I'm not going to say without Hulk, Vince wouldn't have been able to do it, but it would have been a lot harder. Yeah, no doubt. So, able to follow that path of the rock and wrestling connection and movie stars. I think with Hulk, though, everybody else fell into their, their rightful spot. You know, Piper, number one heel, Orndorff, kind of like that, that number two heel. Like, I feel like everybody fell into the right spot with Hulk uh, at, at the top. Right. Now, Going back to WCW 95, so Beefcake at this point, when, when the master is kind of coming into this, he's the man with no name. He went from the butcher, the man with no name. He's, I mean, he's got a million different names. I feel like they're all like Hogan <laughs> creations as far yeah. as the names. Who's, it's like, you know, the man with no name, the butcher, uh, the booty man, like all these queries. Is that all Hogan saying like that's what you want? Or is Beefcake pushing that? It, it was, uh, I'm sure Butcher, uh, not Butcher, but B B Beefcake and Hogan got together and came up with the name. So let me tell you a side story about the butcher. That cost WCW, I would think, I'm just surmising again, estimating, a hundred grand because Abdullah the butcher sued them. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So he, well, technically, I guess he owns the name 
obviously okay. Abdul the butcher. So you couldn't use anything butcher the butcher anything like that. Using in lawsuits, I call it too similar. Uh, there's another word before too something and similar. Is it? Hmm. Interesting. I, involved, didn't... I had the gym. Didn't know that. That's interesting. So eventually, he's going to become the Zodiac, which is perhaps the weirdest of all these gimmicks in the Dungeon of Doom. The yes, no, the face paint, the weird haircut. Whose idea? Is this you creating that? No. That was uh, Hulk and Brutus. What did you think of it? Well, you know, I like Brutus. You know, he he always looked good. but they were so joined at the hip, you had to do what Hogan, he had creative control, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I think if Brutus had taken one name, I mean, uh, whatever they could have come up with and get away with close to you know what I mean? Whether it be something else, he, they, they should have done that because once they lost that lawsuit, they were... I'm sure they're getting pressure on the from the North Tower saying, "Hey, don't ever make a mistake like that again." You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. they went for. I, so I just think the Zodiac, you know, the the gimmick is so '80s and it's so campy, and they're supposed to be these horrifying gimmicks, but they're really come off corny. Did you kind of think that at the time, or you're not even like, "Ah, oh, whatever." John, I I I had thought, and I thought I portrayed it fairly well, a serious heel. Mm-hmm. I knew what I was doing here. It was literally cutting my own throat. You know, but I knew, you know, the uh, the end justified the means. And I needed to turn them heel. I needed to turn them heel. Hey, everybody has a shelf life and this country, we love to tear down heroes, but we love to see them rise from the ashes. Mm-hmm. So when he became a heel, they wanted a boom, especially when he said, I fooled you. When you, I said, take your prayers and uh, say your prayers and take your vitamins. And But when he rose from the ashes as a heel, he became a bigger baby face. So I think that... Uh, it was the right thing for me to do, and I think it was the right thing for the company. With this group, so eventually Avalanche, who's John Tent, is then going to become the shark. Who's creating that crazy, weird gimmick? And I never understood how John became the shark. You know what I mean? You know, I never understood that. All of a sudden, you know, I was told that he's the shark. And I, I, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand the correlation to, you know, if you're a shark, you've got to win, I think. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? Well, is that Hogan again and, and Tenton making it up? Uh, I'm not sure if John came up with the idea, but you got to realize, too. These guys were very loyal to Hulk, and rightfully so, that if Hulk came up with the name Cowflap, they were going to say, yeah. And that's no disrespect for them because they, it wasn't that they were just uh, followers. They believed in Hulk because they had drawn huge money in New York with them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and Hulk could be very persuasive because his track record in drawing money was second to none. It was not even close to the business, was it? No. Mm-mm. Definitely not. Now, you also add in Kamala, who makes sense in the group. When you think about it, I mean, he's just a weird kind of 80s style character, drew huge money with Hogan in 1987 leading up to and, and late 86 leading up to WrestleMania three. So, I mean, you could see why Kamala's added to the group. Did you think he added to the group or did you think this? OK, there's another 80s guy that's probably not going to work in 1995. Well, I was on the fence of him not working uh, in 1995, but. Kamala had drawn big money, too. The other thing is that people forget. We had signed a deal with New Japan. Kamala was a huge star in Japan. Yeah. He had a baby face in Japan. 
and I knew what James could do in the ring. Okay, with a character like Kamala who had all that exposure in New York, wrestled Hogan, wrestled The Undertaker, what could you have done with him except be Kamala? Could he become Big James Harris again? I don't think nope. so. He fit in to me where there's a willing suspension of disbelief with Kamala that the rest of us until later on didn't have. So because he had that he was Kamala, he kept his name and he had all that exposure in New York. And it was good because the Japanese liked it. Absolutely. Now, then you're going to add in Ming, who makes sense in a, in a certain sense. Maybe that weird headdress thing that he had, that weird kind of looking, I don't even know what it was, lion or whatever the heck it was, that headdress was there, or dragon, I think it was, but very weird. I think Ming kind of fit the group, probably the best worker uh, in the group, but that's for sure. Uh, um, what did you think about adding Ming to the, to the fray? First of all, I love Ming. I mean, one of the things I've always got, I told, uh, you know, Jay, Jacob Fatu, when I managed him one time a couple of years ago, I said, you're my fourth generation of Samoans I've worked with. Uh, one of the things about the Island Boys, they all know how to work. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And 98% of them look fabulous. And the other thing is Ming added credibility to us you know you could look at the rest of us but except for the mask and then later on he dropped that you know what i mean mm -hmm. time goes on ming would give you an a plus match every time he went out there and then you kind of he's like i wouldn't say he's really a member of the group but he's kind of a member of the group big van vader because of his hatred of hogan you know he's showing up <laughs> and stuff did you think vader fit the group at all Here's, here's why I think Vader fit the group. If you could split the group down, it was me trying to slowly push Hogan into the reality-based wrestling. And what Vader and Ming mm -hmm. and Kamala, because of all the exposure, it started to go a little bit more that way. And we know what Vader, the money Vader drew. And again, mm -hmm. he was uh, a welcome addition to our company because of his relationship with Japan. So to have him on our thing, meaning the dungeon, it helped, I think, add a little credibility. Not that as... the... Right, I got you. As the dungeon is moving along and you're in this, you know, literally in that dungeon and it kind of looks like a, you know, dim, dark, horror, bad horror movie, something like that. Who's creating that set and putting that together for the dungeon for you and the master? The, the dungeon where we did all those vignettes. Is that what you're yep. talking about? Yep. There was a company in Tampa that did that. And I think maybe Hulk had an idea and they kind of, you know, they storyboarded it. And we got to, we did them, I think, in two days. My memory serves me, right? And it was in a warehouse where they built that stuff. These people actually, you know, they weren't fly by night. They did stuff for Hollywood, too. Cool cool set, but maybe didn't fit with wrestling. You know you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if it necessarily fit with where WCW wanted to be headed in 1995. No, it... it it was not where we wanted to head. And I mean, I'm sure Eric felt the same way. In fact, I know he felt the same way. But you got to remember this. We, not we, you know, people, I don't know if a lot of people know this. You know, Hogan was not on a WCW contract. He was on a personal service contract to turn up. There can't be any more power than that, right? Right. And 
wanting him to be comfortable to me was the most important thing because it was like, we're playing chess. I'm going to move my knight out and uh, he's going to come with his bishop and uh, I'm trying to get him to play the game and he wins that he feels confident that I can direct them the right way, that I'm not going to have him do anything that he's not comfortable with. And then when he turned heel, it was the biggest pop of the history of, biggest turn at that time in pro wrestling. Yeah, no doubt about that. What's Bischoff's role creatively at this point? Because it's so many times he said that he had nothing to do with the Dungeon of Doom. He's kind of saying, he's like, that was Kevin Sullivan, you know, almost saying like, I had nothing to do with Dungeon of Doom. What was his creative input at this time? Probably he didn't have much, but it wasn't that. It was all my ideas because it was I was given the ingredients to work mm -hmm. with. Yep. Whether I did it right or wrong, I'm not sure, but I certainly couldn't put those guys, Discount Ming and Barbarian later and uh, Vader, I certainly couldn't put those guys in matches with... Uh, Dr. Death or Mike Rotunda or, or the Steiners, you know, they were directed. It was like I was doing, uh, I was doing a basic instinct movie along with Plan 9 from Outer Space in between the movie. Yep. You know what yep. I mean? And it was hard to do that balancing act. It was hard for me, too, personally, because... As I said, I had been a pretty serious heel, and I didn't, I knew, I had to get him so comfortable to work outside of not working with friends. It took me a long time to gain his trust. And I think it took a lot of those guys a long time to gain his trust. So it was, uh, you know, again, I'm repeating myself, but it was the ends that justified the beans, you know? Yep. Yep. Now, I think the best addition to the Dungeon of Doom would be in 95, well, Fall Brawl 95, really, when the giant, Paul White, makes his debut, comes down, snaps Hogan's neck, saves you from the five minutes alone of you getting your ass kicked. I felt like, I was like, first of all, this guy's a giant. Second of all, he looks great. Third of all, is he really related to Andre? And then fourth was like, this guy is just huge monster, but athletic as hell. The way he just jumped over the rope, you're like, Jesus Christ, who is this guy? So that right. was so interesting. Where did he kind of come from? How did, what, did Hogan bring him in from the Monster Factory? Yeah. How was he kind of uh, brought oh, in? Was it in the Monster Factory? Somehow, and I probably don't have the story right, but this is the legend. Somehow Paul was playing basketball in a minute, league around Chicago and Jimmy Hart and Hulk ran into him when they saw him. And at that time, uh, Paul had a manager and the manager came up to him and Hulk saw him and said, I mean, hey, at that period, WrestleMania three, wasn't it Hogan and him the biggest of all times, Andre and Hogan? Yes. So, hey, he thought he was hit, you know, lightning strikes twice. Yeah, and really, if you think about it, I mean, the giant, obviously green as hell at this point, but wow, did he have potential. I mean, like that mold of clay, it's like you, you don't get seven-foot-plus guys that in shape and like that athletic. Right? I mean, he's a freak of nature. Oh, yeah, and he was really athletic. That was the thing. And the other thing is, don't forget this, John. How young he was. How yeah. Was he back then? 23, 24? I think he was like 23. Yeah, it's super, super young and new to the business. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And he and he got a, a push, you know, obviously right away. His debut is is the you know, beating up the biggest star of all time and you know, snapping his neck. Is that kind of uh you know, can you get any more grandiose than the debut than beating up Hulk? I don't think so. I mean I don't think so. And I think, you know, that was Hulk's idea. I mean, he knew what, what, here's the thing. Maybe I've been sounding hard on Hulk. First of all, Hulk knows what draws money. 
he's a Florida boy. Mm -hmm. he, he, he watched Vinny's television program, so he knew it's our money. Mm -hmm. He drew money with Andre, and he drew money with Paul. And with Paul, it wasn't hard because of what you said. You're watching that as a kid, and you see this supposedly seven foot three or four inch guy jump over and snap Hogan's neck. That's how you get somebody over. And he got him over. And they had, they drew money, big money for a guy that hadn't had. How many matches did he have before the first pay per view? Four? Five? <laughs> yeah, it was Six very five. little. Yeah. Yeah, very little. And, uh, you know, I got to give Hulk credit on that. You know, sometimes people don't give Hulk credit being smart. He's a very smart, he couldn't have been, not been very smart. Uh, if he didn't know how to draw money, he was very smart and he knew what worked, you know, and I think he knew what didn't work too, but he had to feel comfortable. That was the main thing. Like he felt that he got screwed in the AWA and I think that stuck with him. And he knew, you know, you got to remember he left New York. I don't know what the story was, but he could have never have left New York, right? And never had the run in WCW, but he, he just knew what was right for him. You know, his famous line, it doesn't work for me, brother. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. And I feel like with the Giant, obviously, the next pay-per-view that Halloween Havoc 95, the which we can get into at another time because it is, I mean, it's so much going on with the, the monster trucks at the top of the building and, and this and that. But basically, you know, the gist of it, Jimmy Hart turns heel on Hogan. Does it make more sense to him as a heel? Kind of he made no sense with Hogan, right? I, I never thought, I meant, first of all, uh, I've never been a big Babyface manager. I mean, what do they do? You got to keep beating them up. You know what I mean? And that gets repetitious. And Jimmy was a great heel manager in Memphis. Jimmy was my manager in Memphis when I was in mm -hmm. Memphis. Yep. Jimmy is a tremendous manager as a heel. He didn't need to be with Hulk. You know what I mean? And that's real. And then there's, you know, you got to turn there. There's a story there. Jimmy turn on Hulk. Yep. You know? And people forget that Jimmy was a heel manager in New York. And if you think about it, the giant, like you said, he's so green. He's so young, literally almost too new to the business, but he's such a big clump of clay and such a big, um, massive potential. He needs a manager. So right. Jimmy Hart's the perfect manager for him. Right. Right. And the other thing is Jimmy's was a slight guy. You know what I mean? He isn't a big guy. And the contrast, the size worked perfectly. Yep. Now, what about the Yeti, as Tony Schiavone likes to call him, the Yeti? Ron Reese makes his debut. Was it supposed to be somebody else? I always heard a rumor like they were thinking about making if the Warrior was available, it could have been Warrior. If Yoko was available, it could have been Yoko. Was it always going to be Ron Reese under some horrible uh, toilet paper costume? I have no idea how Ron got there. I knew that he was promoted from the camp. And the other thing is, you got to realize Hulk's thing was beating big guys in New York, right? Yep. He saw another big guy and he thought, well, we'll throw this. I don't know where the gimmick came from. And I'm not saying I may not have, I may have come up with it, but I know I you would have thought that. I'm going to say somebody's thinking processes. There's another big guy to go after Hogan. But we we got to wrap him up in something because we can't have him look exactly like Paul. Paul has just got tights and boots on, right? Mm -hmm. We're gonna go to an extreme, and you know, he was. Uh, Rom was a very nice guy. I think that he was saddled with a gimmick that was impossible to get over, and he was still green when he came to TV. Did you think eventually as the giant continues his feud with Hogan, did you think, you know, they put the title on him, obviously, then they take it off and say there's, you know, the controversy. 
because of the contract signed by Jimmy Hart, that the DQ, you become the winner. It was all this confusion. So World War Three, Savage wins. He becomes the world champion. Hogan technically doesn't go over the rope. He goes under. And they do that whole kind of funny gimmick where Hogan goes to see the tape, brother, and the tape is destroyed when they go to watch it. So that's kind of funny. So then there's tension, of course, with him and Savage. Um, did you think that Hogan Giant was the right thing? Or did you think that maybe too much too soon for the big man? At this time, if you're going to make an impact, you got you got one chance to make a first impression. And what would you have done with them? Built them up like we did Goldberg? I don't think so. I think that Hulk wanted it right away, and he knew he could work around his shortcomings, and... I think personally, I think he made the right decision to go with him right away. Because the think... longer he stayed out there, he would have been exposed by other people. And you know, here's the uh, other thing. John, can you hold on one second? Yep, yep. No okay. problem. So, as we're talking here about the Dungeon of Doom with Kevin. He'll be back in just one second. Talking about the Dungeon of Doom here, and it's just one of those things where it's like the Giant was feuding with Hogan, but they also had Macho Man Randy Savage feuding with Ric Flair at this point, which is a much more realistic angle. Miss Elizabeth will turn heel on Macho Man, align herself with Flair. It becomes much more real. Hogan at this point, was feuding with the giant and a little bit of a cartoony thing. We just, me and Kevin were just talking about Halloween Havoc. That whole thing with the Yeti was very, very cartoony and, and very bad. The uh, monster truck rally at the top of the building was one of those things where it's like, uh, that's not really believable and corny and it's kind of bad. Hogan knocks the, the giant off the building. You think the giant's dead. He comes back out later in the night and they still have the match. Very, very campy, very cartoony. Didn't really particularly work i think very well at that point in time did not really enjoy it i enjoyed much of the other things that were going on in wwe the tension with luger and sting with luger being a heel and sting being a baby face but luger aligning himself with jimmy hart and kind of half aligning himself with the dungeon of doom you had rick flair like i just mentioned feuding with savage but it's much more realistic i mean they're talking about um, i know they weren't married at this point in real life, but uh, and storyline wise, you think Savage and Elizabeth are married, so one of those things. But as we welcome Kevin back in, Kevin, as you were saying with uh, the Giant and the Hulkster, that you know, do you think that that feud worked? You, you're saying basically it worked because it wasn't overexposing the Giant, who may have gotten overexposed as green. Yeah, because you know, here's the thing. You know, I'm not gonna bring up the specific match but I booked Goldberg one time and uh, on the streak and he got exposed and I didn't Regal. want that happen. yeah Regal, I didn't yeah. want that happen yeah I didn't want to ha that happen to the giant because you never know you know what I mean mm -hmm. and isn't that guys are doing it intentionally they think it's a way to get a guy over that goes a little bit longer you don't do that with somebody so green like paul mm -hmm. and he's drawn big huge money the rest of his career so i think he started off the right way and he's going to end it the right way now i was i was briefly saying here that i like the other things going on in wcw much more realistic savage versus flair and elizabeth turning and that whole thing that was very realistic very hit home very a little bit of shoot in there too with elizabeth and, and randy i like sting and luger that was awesome stings the baby face luger's the heel luger kind of loosely with jimmy hart and and the dungeon of doom but he still best friends with sting i thought that was really well done how cool was it, or did you think how well it worked? I love it still to this day. I love that feud. Not really feud. It's like the team of Sting and Luger, but Luger is a heel. He's aligned with Jimmy Hart. He's aligned with the Dungeon of Doom, kind of. Is that just, just clever writing, but he's Sting's best friend? I think that that was the best Luger ever was portrayed. He just hit that spot perfectly. Because it was closer to his personality at the time. 
And that, to me, makes a good story when you have somebody close to their personality. Yes. Yep. And Lugo played that excellent, and Sting did too. Uh, that's one of the, my most proudest moments, I think, and it's, people don't bring that up much. Lugo was terrific then. Terrific. It gave him another dimension that he never had before, and I believe after that people were, and they were enjoying his bullshit, you know, make excuses and, oh, <laughs> glad you're here. Uh, you know, I'm sorry I'm late, you know. He was just so dead on, and uh, they did a magnificent job, and they, I, I, I would, I would love to go back and look at the ratings and see when their segment came on. I'm going to take a wild guess and say they drew a quarter of WWF at the time audience off of Raw. When people that, I, you know, People don't understand, John, how over that segment was when Luger and Sting did it because it was so refreshing. And uh, I got that idea when I was a baby face and Austin Idol was a heel. And uh, Jim Barnett, this was his idea. Uh, uh, Idol had turned babyface, and all the babyfaces except him, except me. I wouldn't accept them. And he was wrestling Mark Lewin, and they had me go out like I was going to the concession stand in the arena. And Abdul came down and jumped on Austin, and the people actually pushed me to the ring. And I used to make my interviews saying, I can't believe every time I get up in the morning and look in the mirror and see what I'll do for money to be this guy's partner. So I just tweaked it a little. And they were so, so good. Uh, I thought some nights they carried the whole two hours. Yep. They were fabulous. Loved it. It's so funny. Uh, Luger would use the roller quarters and then, and you know, and, and knock out Harlem Heat. They win the tag titles, whatever. And then Sting would be like, What the hell is this? You'd be like, I don't know. I don't know where that came from. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the fans would try to touch Luger, yeah. and Sting would be looking and he'd give him the five. And as soon as Sting would turn his back, he'd be like, Don't touch me. Oh, gross. Fans. Like, so good. Yeah. And he played that so well, you know. And uh, Lex, you know, sometimes gets a bad rap. And I never, ever had any resistance from Lex Luger. A finish, an angle. Of course, like everybody else, he'd question some things. But, I mean, never a problem. Uh, he gets a bad rap. Uh not everybody could work like Eddie Guerrero. Right. And I'm not hearing from Eddie Guerrero, but Luger, what he might have lacked sometimes in punching ability and stuff like that, he made up for his presence. And in this episode, I think he did an incredible job. Incredible. Luger is underrated to me. I think he's awesome. Uh, people are like, oh, he's not a great worker. That's not not really as important. He could be good and spur, especially when he had the right opponent. He could be great, but it's not really important. He had a presence, charisma, the look, the way he acted, the way he carried himself. He just as soon as you look at the guy, you're like this guy, he's somebody. He's a star. Love Luger. Uh, when he beats Hogan, go off the beaten path here. When he beats Hogan in '97 for the title, that crowd goes nuts. I mean, it was awesome. What a moment for Nitro. Right, right. And I'm now, just people don't understand how over he was. Mm -hmm. I remember him uh, putting the rack on uh, Flair in Baltimore, but he had bled. And the yes. People were crazy, but the athletic commission in Baltimore allowed blood. 
I had to talk to the uh, head of the athletic commission to get that passed because usually he would stop immediately with blood. Right. And the guy's right. name is Fester O'Sullivan. And I had to go up to him and beg. He said, well, I'm going to have my guys leave early. But this is the last time you'll ever do this. I said, okay, thank you. But I mean, Luger doesn't get the credit he deserves. Totally agree. Now, just kind of just a random thought. And I was just thinking about this because we skipped over him. Not that he's important to this specific story, but Evad Sullivan, Dave Sullivan, yep. originally the equalizer. He does kind of look like you, obviously like a taller version of you. Dave Sullivan, where does this Evad, you know, with the rabbit and everything, where does this uh, gimmick and, and this character come from? Very silly, very cartoonish, very 1980s. That was before I even got in the territory. They had made him, I think they had made him Evad before I got there. And he was talking about his big brother coming in. Oh, he's got big hands, got big feet. He's so big, he's so big, he's so big. And again, he was a baby face and I was a heel because I'd been in Atlanta for a lot of time off and on. And the nasty boys were beating him up and I came to the ring and I threw fire on them and that's how we we went with the angle. Yeah, that angle's awesome. Yep. Yeah. And uh, you know, him and Hogan, he became the number one Hulkamaniac. So why? They, they had nothing, like, that's what they wanted for him? I think it was to show you could never do this in today's day, but, you know, he was supposedly, you know, dyslexic and a little slow, and it was showing that Hulk had compassion. You know, he was a Hulkamaniac, and Hulkamaniacs come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. So that's where that I believe he became a pretty good football coach, I believe, uh, in college football yeah. ranks. Nebraska, right? I think so, yeah. I know he's I know he's big into football, and he's big into football equipment. He was doing something with the equipment, too. Really? Good guy. So just moving along, just another random guy that joins the Dungeon of Doom, kind of. Lock Ness, uh, Haystacks Jr., I guess, really. Where the heck did he come from? He just got him from England, I guess? You're like, oh, he fits the group? Huge star in England, okay? I booked him on a Saturday night, and he drew, I forget who he worked with, he drew a 4-5, the biggest Saturday night we had that year. He had drawn, he was called Giant Haystacks in England. And if you ask the English guys, Regal and Finley and those guys, yep, they'll tell you he drew nothing but huge money in England. And at this time, I started to look around, what is missing with WCW? There was the international flair. Because after that, when I brought Conan in, he helped me get Rey Mysterio and opened the doors for the Luchadors. And I then I uh, Regal mentioned Fit Finley, and Terry Funk told me he was one of the five best workers he ever saw. So I brought him in, and, you know, I wanted to give the show a international flair, but to legitimize the international stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We had like, a, and then I kind of mockered it with uh, uh, Regal, who did a tremendous job with Bobby Eaton, right? Yes. You know, Eaton, uh, Sir Bobby Eaton. And the Bobby Earl of Eaton. And, and John, if you remember back in the day, everybody was some from, Singapore or parts unknown or whatever. So I want to make it wanted to make it legit. And I thought just by adding uh, legitimacy to where somebody came from, it also added legitimacy to the business. Yeah. Now, as far as like the Dungeon of Doom at this point, they're going to then team up with the Four Horsemen and you and Arn, I mean, we'll talk, talk more in detail about a lot of this stuff in future episodes. But basically, the alliance to end Hulkamania. Is this almost like, wow, you need 20 guys to beat Hulk and, and Savage and you know, maybe exactly. a little bit of Sting as friend? Like, is that almost overkill? Is that crazy or is that making Hogan comfortable? It was making Hogan comfortable, but I knew at this time 
I had to get the baby faces hot because I didn't know what was coming, but I knew around the corner I was going to dump all kinds of heat on the heels. So I'm a heel booker, and I said, you know, you can't be a knight in shaming, shining armor killing salamanders. You have to slay dragons. Right. So I got to get these guys, you know, before me, they had been doing 50-50 booking. And I said, okay, we got to polish the armor up. We got to take their swords and grind them down. And let's get these guys up and running before we make the heel turn. The Alliance and Hulkamania then adds in Z Gangsta, which is Tiny Zeus, Lidster Zeus, and the ultimate solution, Zeet Swenson. I mean, just uh, <laughs> these two mammoth freaking guys. It was that just totally 80s? I mean, where did they come from? Did you bring them in? Like, who's bringing them in? I mean, that seems like a little bit at a, at a time, at a touch. Well, it was not just a little out of touch. They, what do they, those two guys have in common, John? You know? Both movie stars, right? Technically? Both, or both gigantic? <laughs> both what you said, but the first thing you hit it on the head. What did Hulk, what was Hulk doing at that time? Trying to get in the movies. What did Jeep Swenson work with? Arnold, right? Arnold, yeah, yep. Okay. What did Jesse yep. Ventura, who did Jesse Ventura work with? Arnold, yeah. Was there a little thing between Jesse and Hulk? Oh, yeah. Big time. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And obviously, he knows Zeus, no holds barred, feuded with him yeah. in WWF. But, which was what? A movie produced by the WWE, right? Yep. So, yep. That's where you know, it's, just, it's just almost like, wow. So, Hogan and Savage are in this cage match at Uncensored. This, you know, the, the, the Terror Dome, the tower, tower Cage, the three tiered cage. It's just like, like, almost unbelievable i know you try to put their back up against the wall and no one thinks they're going to win they end up winning but it's one of those things where it's like wow i mean we'll get into this on a further episode and for in further detail but i as a fan i was like okay i liked uh you know uh, sting sting and booker against the road warriors whatever you know whatever else is going on that night but i was like that eh, i don't know about that no that was uh that was and no disrespect to help, but I think he was on a fishing expedition. Hmm. That he also could bring guys from the movies into his world. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder, like, I know they're only going to be there for a short time, but I wonder if he actually thought, like, that would be something that would just help him out or help the Dungeon of Doom or... It, was it, you know, was it primarily just like, okay, I'm just going to beat these two monsters and we're just going to move on to the next one. I need some more, like you said, I need some more dragons to slay. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, again, he, he was, he knew what worked for him. He had a formula, big guys. I saw, I hulk up, I dropped the lake. And he knew what worked for him and when you get comfortable, and I always say this, and if someone's listening to us that's a booker, the worst thing you can do is fall into patents because it's a way to burn out quickly. And uh, sometimes you should put your best match you got on first. Uh, don't save it to last. Put it on first. Make the people come say, oh, gee, we missed that last week. Uh but he fell into a patent at work, and you cannot knock it because it drew millions of dollars. But it was, as we see later on, the time is coming for the change. With the Dungeon of Doom, you'll see, you know, Hogan starts dressing in black. You guys making him dark. You know, you're slowly getting more into that. You end up at one point shaving his mustache. Is that right. all Hulk's idea, or this is your idea of, of where you want Hulk to be? The shaving of the mustache was he was going to do that movie where he played Zeus, remember? The, oh, yeah, yeah, yep. He didn't, have to, he didn't he couldn't have a mustache because the movie you had, had, didn't have him having a mustache. So he used it for an angle to get heat on us. Makes sense, very smart. Yeah, he was very smart. Him wearing black, your idea or his? 
his idea, and let me tell you, that was, you picked up on something really cool, John. That was the night, I think, that it finally hit him that I was right. If you look back at that interview, Hulk is coming down with a black bandana, all in black, right? We're in Chicago. The building's booing him. Mm-hmm. And what's Mean Gene, what he says, you can hear the somber night tonight from the fans. He, he, he saved Hulk. They were booing him. He was saying the aura of the building was horror. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. As if something was going on that night. Yeah, yep. He did an incredible job on thinking on his feet. And that night when I got to him, I said, what I told you all along is it's starting to make sense. And he said, you know, let me run it by, brother. You know, so he started to see maybe for the first time it hit him in the face that, boy, I could turn and maybe make a lot of money. And as we move forward in 96, the Scott Hall, Kevin Nash debut, Hogan's heel turn at Bash of the Beach, which we've talked about before. It's one of those things where it's like the Dungeon of Doom are now not – maybe if they were one and one day with the Horsemen as the top heel group, it's like, well, now the NWO is one and everyone else falls in two, three, four behind them, right? So now the Dungeon of Doom aren't as powerful. The Hogan and the NWO is the top heel group. Yeah, and the, and, and the Dungeon was actually – uh, went from going for Hogan to actually letting the NWO pick our bones. Uh, you know, the famous one we talked about in Orlando, right? They came down with the horseman against the dungeon. Oh, there's, they're here. Remember? Yep. We run the back. Before that, we had a main event, the dungeon, the four way, the dungeon against the horseman. And we drew a huge number and they came down and picked each one of us off you know the nwo and that was in chattanooga tennessee and it was perfect for me was they could come down and pick our bones when we've gone 10 or 15 minutes and two of us are hurt you know one of the horsemen gets hurt one of the dungeon gets hurt two other guys are in the ring they come down and just lay all eight guys out yep yeah. basically dismantled, like you said, like dismantled the uh, the dungeon. And the dungeon would add guys like Big Bubba Rogers. I don't know if he really makes sense, but, you know, he would be in the dungeon. But then he would join the NWO eventually. Um, Conan would be in the dungeon. I don't think he really fit that group, although, you know, he's, he's a great wrestling, great charisma. Right? Do you think Conan fit? No. Conan well, should have been on his own. Uh, Conan has got a... Uh, uh, the other thing about Conan was he brought the Hispanic audience with, to, with him. A lot of people don't give him credit for that. He brought, uh, you know, Carlos is uh, half Cuban, half Puerto Rican, and wrestled. He was a huge star in Mexico. So he brought three of the factions of the Hispanics to us. And especially in, you know, Miami, that means a lot. The guy I was forgetting, Hugh Morris, Bill DeMott, he actually fit the group when you brought him, right? I mean, he fit perfectly. Yes. I met Bill in Japan, and I I gave him a job. He was a big, impressive guy, could move, super strong. He could do anything. Bill was a wonderful performer. I feel like underrated. A lot of people don't realize he was a damn good wrestler, good athlete. Underrated. Way underrated. I saw him in Japan. I was there the first time he tried to moonsault in the afternoon, and I couldn't believe he hit it. You know what I mean? We put a big pad out for him, the, a mat. Uh, it was like an amateur wrestling mat. We rolled it up into a tight circle and did the moonsault. I couldn't believe, you know. That's the first time I saw a guy that big do one. Unbelievable. He had a great moonsault, uh, for sure. Yeah. No laughing matter, as he called it. Yeah. A guy you brought up before. Definitely fit the Dungeon of Doom, another awesome wrestler. The Barbarian, when he got put in the group, he fit in. Oh, I mean, the Barbarian is the real deal, and that helped out, and especially having Ming and Barb together as a tag team or singles. I knew I was going to get an incredible match, either or, and they were so solid. It it kind of uh, gave us, again, a little bit more respectability. Yeah, when you put Ming and Barbarian out there, it's uh, <laughs> you know the faces of fear. I mean, they're they're awesome tag team, yeah. 
definitely really good. Now, Max Muscle was in at one point. I just thought like that was weird. Kind of didn't make sense, right? I mean, it's like eh, kind of forcing him. I guess trying to get him some TV time. Yeah, he was a friend of Dallas's, and he got put in the group, and uh, he wasn't there long. He was a very nice guy. Very short time in was Braun the Leprechaun. He he was thrown in there. Very cartoonish. Very eighties. Yeah, and then. And then a guy who I loved in the group and kind of wasn't there long enough was One Man Gang when he was in the group. I love the One Man Gang. I mean, uh, uh, the gang is one of the nicest people you could ever meet. And the gang drew a lot of money. And again, a guy that went, he was drew money with Hogan, right, as a key. Yep, yep. And uh, he fit perfectly. Again, another one of the family members of uh, Hogan's. Yeah, another guy, yep. Yeah. Now, somebody that got thrown in there female-wise was Miss Jacqueline, who was yeah. going to be your partner against basically Ben Wan Woman. But what do you think about Miss Jackie? She's kind of doesn't fit the group in, in the sense of like the whole cater stuff, but she fits in there with you because she's tough, can work, and she's going to help you and get your back. And uh, what I was going to push for, and I'm... Um, <laughs> This is kind of me breaking my rules, but she was so tough, legitimately tough. I was going to put her over in a match. Really? Wow. Yeah. I was going to put her over because if you notice that we were building up to it, I kept on saying the only guy that can beat her is me. The only guy that can beat her is me. And I was going to have a split between her and me. It might not have been a match, but she was going to knock me out. And she probably could have done it in real life, you know. <laughs> she was definitely tough. Now, as the Dungeon of Doom, basically, you know, the giant will join the NWO and then break off from the NWO, and then he's going to turn babyface and feud with Hogan, which was really well done. We'll get into that, of course, on a future episode. But, like, the Dungeon of Doom is, is losing members, and it's kind of losing power. Eventually, it becomes the first family with Jimmy Hart, and, he, you know, he has Ming and Barbarian, and, and he has Knobs and Jerry Flynn, and, um, of course, you know, he'll, he'll kind of He'd still be there, but not be a top heel group. When you retire and lose your retirement match to Benoit in 97, is that basically like Dungeon Doom is over at that point? Basically, yeah. you, you, you're you writing them off really as your retirement? Right. And here's the thing. We got to where we needed to be. Hogan turned heel. There was no mm -hmm. need for comedy anymore. We were stone cold uh don't mean to use that term, Stone Cold, but we <laughs> we were getting more and more serious as the weeks went on. Now, the end of the Dungeon of Doom is just one of those things where it's like, okay, you know, we're going to move on. You still had the Horsemen. Obviously, the NWO was hot to trot, still 97, and, and even into 98 was still the definite, definite biggest angle uh, in wrestling for WCW. Now, as far as, you know, you, you retire, you're still booking, obviously. But if you think about this, it's like, where did the Dungeon of Doom come from? So you're just thinking of, okay, it's, it's definitely because of Hogan and it, it felt the need and it worked because it got him to turn heel. It got him to join the NWO. If you go back and you listen to Bischoff, you say, where did it come from? He was saying that there was some psychedelic drugs. I think he's joking, obviously, but he's saying there's some psychedelic drugs going on between you and Hogan, and that's where the Dungeon of Doom was formed. I know he's kind of joking, but it almost seems it sounds <laughs> it sounds legit. <laughs> it sounds legit. It sounds legit. I mean, I I don't think. Uh, hopefully, if I was on a trip, I'd come up with something a little bit cleaner. But uh, <laughs> you know. I think he, he did it in, in jest, but uh, I look back at it now and, you know, it's like I heard Terry Taylor say something just recently when someone said he gave you the Red Rooster gimmick, meaning Vince. And he said, yeah, and that's what people, why people still remember me. Well, the Dungeon of Doom, as you said, all of a sudden it's the number one wanted to hear about it. And I like to take credit for it all, but Hogan laid it out, and I kind of uh, piece mailed it together and did it the best of my ability. So it yeah. worked. It worked. Now, right. Just kind of a, a, a summary or, or like a brief overview. If I say Dungeon of Doom, 
what do you think of? I know you're saying now it's actually a little bit different than what you would have thought of it. Like it kind of is not as remembered as badly as maybe it was before. What's the kind of final thought thought on the Dungeon of Doom? My final thought was it did what I needed to do to get Hogan turned heel. So the end justified the means. And I think it hurt a lot of those guys, but none of those guys were Hulk Hogan. And nobody's going to draw the money he did. And and you're saying now fans are actually kind of, when they see you and talk about it, they actually kind of like it now rather than rip on it like they used to. Yeah, when I used to go to a convention, people would kind of rip on it. Now, John, it's they're saying, when I was a kid, that was my favorite thing. So maybe it was a little bit of the reality-based dressing was over the kids' heads, and they had still remembered Hogan for Say Your Prayers, Thank You Vitamins, and Hulkamania, that they went along with it until they got a little bit older and then got drifted off of the Dungeon of Doom and went to the NWO. But we had them watching. That's literally me, probably in a nutshell, as a fan. Huge Hulkamaniac through the 80s. As the 90s came, you know, when he goes to WCW, Almost kind of like, wow, I like this, uh, I like this, you know, darker side of Hogan. You know what I mean? Like when he turns NWO. And then, of course, me and all my buddies obsessed with the NWO for years. And, you know, so it touches. But that is, I think that's like the, the crux of it. Like so many fans were like, ah, we're sick of the, you know, yellow and red brother. We want to see something. And then when he turned, I, I, we loved it. I know a lot of fans were throwing some trash in the ring, but uh, we were loving it as fans for sure. Yeah, and I think that throwing the trash in the ring is great because that means God heat and did what it was supposed to do. And he did it tremendously. Yes, absolutely. Now, as far as some plugs, you can follow me on Twitter at Two Man Power Trip. You can follow me on Instagram at Two Man Power Trip as well. And you can follow Kevin on Instagram at Taskmaster Talks. Of course, you go to Kevin Sullivan's Pro Wrestling Tea Store. Just go to Pro Wrestling Tees.com and type in Kevin Sullivan. He's got a great store there. And then, of course, Double Hell T shirts. Go to Double Hell T shirts. Type it in on Google. You'll find it. You'll see me there on Twitter as well. They got some awesome Kevin Sullivan shirts. They have a great line. It's like, hey, complete line of shirts for kevin so right double hell is uh, the kind of the place to go for some great merchandise for you also just want to mention do you have any uh things going on as far as per personal appearances anything coming up not until the end of the month i'm going to new york to do a virtual signing for a day but i'll give you more uh information about that next week Awesome. Good stuff. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this week and every week right here on Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan. See you next week, folks. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.